All right, good evening. What's poppin'? It's your boy, Big Rich, Queens, New York City, Friday Night Business, Mob Story Season 2. Let's get right into it. Part 2 of the series I told you about, Guilt for the Guiltless, the story of Stephen Crea and the murder of Michael Meldich and other tales. All right, first of all, we know who this is sponsored by. This whole series, from beginning to end, is sponsored by Justice Tech Pros. Please go check them out on YouTube. Subscribe to their channel. Great videos, great graphics, but more importantly, great information given out by Dominic and his team. So please, get a chance, go subscribe today. You will not, you will not regret it. All right, let's get right into business. Mob Story, Season 2, Part 2. The Rat Squad Files of Disgracia. At the time of the indictment, the only witness the prosecution had trying Crea and Stephen D. to Meldish's murder was a guy by the name of Frank Pasqua III. Pasqua was an informant who started working with the FBI in March of 2015 after a drug bust in Mississippi. He had a long history of drug abuse and domestic violence and had previously been arrested numerous times on drug charges. Pasqua was also the son of Frank Jr., an alleged member of the Lucchese family, and Frank Sr., an alleged member of the Gambino family, before his death. Shortly after his arrest, Pasqua met with the FBI and told the fascinating story about how the Meldish hit really went down. It was a story that didn't quite gel with what the feds touted when they eventually charged Crea, Stephen D., and others in February and May of 2017. The real story, according to court records, was that Pasqua and his father had met with Stephen D. and agreed to murder Meldish. Stephen D.'s only explanation was the hit order comes from the top. Mikey's got to go, and my dad, Stephen L. Crea, knows about it. Following their orders, Pasqua and his father went to pick Meldish up and bring him to Mulberry Street to pick up about 100 grams of heroin on consignment with the intention that they would wait until when Meldish could pay for the 100 grams to kill him and then keep the money. Pasqua reported that after arriving at the meetup location, he and his father walked towards Meldish's car, and as Pasqua began to get in the front seat, his father told him to go get the iPad from their car so they can have a map to get where they needed to go afterwards. Pasqua went to retrieve the iPad, and as he was doing so, he heard what he initially thought was a car door slam, but then realized it was a gunshot. When he looked to see what was happening, he saw that Meldish's car door was left open and that his father was walking towards him. Pasqua's father then said, it's done, and directed him not to say anything. But if anyone asks, say you killed Meldish so you can get the credit for it. The duo then left the scene and dropped their car in front of a parking lot. The story seems to fit with the reported evidence of Meldish's murder scene. He was shot on the right side of the head, presumably by a passenger in his car, and the driver's side door was open. But Pasqua's story was about to change in a big way. Strange tales. In May of 2015, Pasqua had been transferred from a Mississippi jail to the MDC in Brooklyn. While there, he also had an epiphany about what really happened the night Michael Meldish was murdered. Apparently, the first story he told was a mistake because according to him, he and his father weren't involved in the murder at all. Yet he insisted that Korea and Stephen D were behind it. The funny thing though is that his epiphany came only after he learned Landanio had been officially charged with Meldish's murder. And the only part of his story that changed was that he and his father had nothing to do with it, but somehow he was still involved in a conversation with supposed top guys about a murder. But there are even more oddities to this strange tale. According to the court documents, Pasqua originally told this story to FBI agent Jennifer Laurie and Brooklyn U.S. Attorney Nicole Argentieri. But Pasqua's story was suspicious. Even though back in 2016, the rumors were that Argentieri's informant would blow the case wide open. The two decided to put Pasqua on the shelf. Soon after, though, FBI agent Ted Otto and U.S. Assistant Attorney Scott Hartman got wind of Pasqua's tail and decided to dust him off as their golden ticket towards a federal indictment. This particular change of agents and attorneys happened right before Pasqua had his epiphany. 
and Otto was already familiar with the case, having been the same agent who wrote the complaint against Landanio that got him arrested on federal gun charges and detained at the MDC in the first place. And while the government later claimed that Pasqua was confused about the details of the murder, Pasqua never once wavered from his original story during the four meetings he had with the FBI from March 2015 through October 2015. Right after Pasqua's retelling of his tall tale to Otto and Hartman, he conveniently agreed to wear a wire and befriend Landonio in the hopes that Landonio would give the feds the evidence they needed to tie in their targets for a federal indictment. To make it even easier, they arranged for Pasqua to become Landonio's cellmate at the MDC. During that time, Pasqua recorded a lot of conversations too. After all, Pasqua had connections, and it seemed logical that Landania would feel comfortable talking with him. From that time, Pasqua agreed to wear wire through July 2017. Over 30 in-person and telephone recordings were made while he was in jail with Landania, while visiting Landania after being released from the MDC, and even during telephone conversations with Landania when he couldn't visit. Yet, in all those recorded conversations, not one implicated Crea. Stephen D., or even Landanio himself in the Meldish murder. Another interesting point is that prosecutors had not turned over the evidence or even released Pasqua's name to defense counsel because they said they needed more time to secure CW1 safety. But this was false because during that time, Pasqua was still wired up and trying to gather evidence from Landanio. He had secured 25 recordings after the May 2015 indictment and 11 more after the February 2017 superseding one. Besides that, several of the conversations seemed to indicate that Pasqua didn't even believe the lies he himself had told and many showed Landanio didn't know much about the murder either. In a July 9, 2016 conversation, Pasqua told Landanio that he believed the Lucchese family didn't have anything to do with the murder. In a November 24, 2016 conversation, Landanio told Pasqua that fucking anybody could have did that shit, bro. The list goes mile long. In a conversation on February 3, 2017, after Pasqua asked who committed the murder, Landanio replied, Terry Caldwell didn't do it, bro. And in the same conversation, Pasqua told Landanio he shouldn't worry about the murder charge because he didn't have shit to do with it. It didn't seem as though Pasqua to be a very useful witness for the feds, even with his new handlers. Besides his own revised story, there was no other proof to back up what he claimed. The government was so nervous about their star witness, it even filed a motion requesting the court ban the defense from cross-examining Pasqua on his super shady past, including a 2012 felony conviction for violating an order of protection and threatening his wife, which the feds called deplorable, but wasn't an indication of a witness's truthfulness. A 2014 conviction of shoplifting, which the feds called a simple shoplifting event where he forgot to pay for an item he accidentally placed in his pocket. Numerous incidents of domestic violence, including a 2006 rape accusation because he hadn't actually been convicted, or any questions about his mental health or drug abuse because it had no bearing on his credibility. Despite their efforts to limit the damage, the government's golden witness was about to implode. They needed a backup and found someone who was even a bigger winner than Pasqua, a hookah smoking agent and his delusional jailhouse snitch. On September 13, 2017, federal prosecutors charged Landania with concocting an elaborate and fantastical plan to escape from the MDC who had been housed since being charged with Meldish's murder the previous February. The Fed said it was like a script for a made-for-TV movie that involved a hacksaw, dental floss, and rope made out of tied-up bedsheets with co-starring roles being given to his mother, father, wife, and even a priest. Side note, the September charges against Landanio barely made a blip on the news front, but in October of 2019, more than two years later, after Gangland obtained a 10-page detail report taken by Otto, this sick made-up fantasy story by the feds made headlines around the world. And they weren't nice. We're not going to get into the specifics of the ludicrousness here, but there's a lot to be said. The full story will be posted soon. The bogus escape charge was based on information from a jailhouse snitch, a disgracia. 
by the name of David Evangelista. Evangelista was a grammar school educated heroin addict with documented mental problems, including depression, anxiety, and PTSD, and suicidal tendencies. He once swallowed razor blades while in his prison psychologist's office, who had also robbed several banks in Brooklyn in 2005. He had been sentenced to 12 years in prison, but in November of 2016, a few months before he was set to be released, he decided he was well enough to go back into society on his own and escape from a Bronx halfway house. He promptly robbed two more banks and attempted to rob a third. When he was arrested that December, he was taken to a hospital for evaluation at his request and then tried to escape from custody. He told marshals he had to use the bathroom, climbed onto the sink, and tried to escape through the ceiling. He even punched a hole in the wall to get the adjacent room to facilitate his escape. After he was subdued, he quickly attempted to make a deal with authorities to snitch on people he thought would be of interest to them in order to get a better plea for himself because he knew he was going to get slammed for the additional bank robberies and the escape itself. Evangelista even offered up his own brother and another guy he met in jail who he claimed had committed a murder. By the way, when Evangelista left the halfway house before going on his bank robbing rampage, he claimed he first went to dispose of the body of the man his jailhouse friend had supposedly killed. It was wrapped in a tarp and hidden in an alley, apparently. Evangelista also wasn't a very skilled bank robber, since he only got $40 from one bank and about $1,200 at the other, but it wasn't enough for him to buy heroin to satisfy his craving. Despite all this intriguing information he had in his back pocket, prosecutors declined his offer. Perhaps it was because they knew he had a long history of lying and being a snitch, a disgraciad, especially on people he was told to watch when officials needed it. So why pay him when they could get the information for free? After the hospital incident, Evangelista was transferred to the MCC in Manhattan. On May 12, 2017, he was then accidentally released. Instead of taking advantage of the situation, he decided to turn himself in like the good boy that he was after visiting his mother, telling authorities that they had made a mistake. He became a jailhouse laughing stock. He was also set to face an additional 45 years behind bars because of those additional crimes. Evangelista didn't want any more prison time because prison didn't agree with him. He desperately wanted to make a deal, which is why he said he walked back through the doors of the MCC. While the odds didn't appear to be in his favor, he got lucky when Aginato opened the magic door. Around this time, Landania was accidentally put into the GEO facility in Queens. It was well known throughout the prison population as the Rat Jail. He sat there for eight days before prison officials realized that it was a mistake and returned him to the MDC. But you can be sure that word about his GEO visit had already gotten around, and it compounded the falsity and ludicrousness of the rumor the feds had already insinuated with all their informant rumors they leaked to the press. Shortly after Evangelista's return to the MCC, he ended up talking with another set of prosecutors and agents who were willing to listen. The same ones, by chance, who happened to be working on the Meldish murder case, including Agent Otto. Then, almost like magic, Evangelista found himself at the MDC where Christopher Landanio had just returned. He even ended up in the same cell block as Landanio, a convenient three cells down. The very same day Evangelista arrived at the MDC, he met Landanio and the two reportedly became fast friends. So much so that within the same week, Landanio bared his soul to his new best buddy. At least that's the first story the government told. According to court documents, Landanio divulged intricate details about his involvement in the Meldish murder. He even shared with Evangelista his devious plan to escape the confines of the MDC. And Evangelista was an old pro at hearing jailhouse confessions too. Back when he was at the MCC, there was another inmate who had confided in him about his escape plans, which supposedly included discussion about jumping out of an 11th floor window with bed sheets. It kind of makes you ask the same question Caldwell's attorney, George Goldster, asked of Evangelista at the October 2019 trial. Is there something about you, your personality, if you know, that makes people confess to you? 
Evangelista claimed he didn't want to tattletale on his best buddy and tried to stay quiet but was getting nervous because he thought Landania was going to go through with the escape. Evangelista hadn't yet been sentenced and he still didn't have an official deal with the feds. But he didn't want to get into trouble by not saying something about it beforehand if Landaño happened to be successful. Even though Evangelista himself was planning to join in on the escape. So on August 1, 2017, he decided to come clean and confess all he knew about the prison psychologist who contacted the feds, who then sent FBI agent Otto to take Evangelista's statement. A month later... Landanio was hit with the escape charge and the feds had more evidence about Meldish's murder too. However, the whole scenario, however, the whole scenario seems off. First, Landanio didn't know Evangelista from Adam. He and Evangelista didn't have any connections other than both of them being Italian. And they weren't even cellmates, only housed together in the same cell block. Yet, he confesses everything to this complete stranger he only knew for a week but never went into any details ever with Pasqua, a guy he actually formed a relationship with. Think about it. Pasqua and Landanio were cellmates. Pasqua and Landanio talked on the phone. Pasqua even visited Landanio in jail. And Pasqua had been recording conversations with Landanio through July 2017. Yet not one of these times did Landanio ever confess to him about the escape, let alone the murder. But let's get back to that confession. Pre-trial court documents show that right after Landanio returned from a visit with his mother, he immediately confessed to Evangelista about everything Meldish. Evangelista reported that Landanio was irate because he learned that the Kriyas, who had ordered him to kill Meldish, had been released on bail while he remained in custody. Landanio was referring to his mistaken belief that the Kriyas had gotten bail. However, Landanio never met his mother on the day Evangelista claimed, and the information he received about the Kriyas' bail was via an email discussion with her, not a jailhouse visit. Even though Landanio's mother had specifically said the Kreyas didn't get bail, he thought they did when she wrote they were in-house. And despite Evangelista's claim that Landanio was irate, the July 13, 2017 email tells a complete different story. In reply to his mother's news, Landanio wrote, Interesting. Wow. That's great for them. Love you. Talk to you later. A complete contradiction of Evangelista's claim. It wasn't until a few days later in another email that Landanio realized he had misunderstood what his mother was telling him, but that wasn't the only thing Evangelista had gotten twisted up in this twisted fairy tale. The myth of Stevie Wonder. Landanio said a lot of things to Evangelista during his alleged confession. Now remember, Landanio and Evangelista had only known each other for 65 days a little more than two months before the jailhouse snitch had bared his soul to prison officials and the FBI. But like everything else the government claimed, that time period would change by the time the trial came around. Remember, too, that Landanio had known Pasqua a lot longer and talked to him a lot more, and as was documented in hours upon hours of recorded conversations. Yet, Landanio never went into this kind of spectacular detail. And while almost every other informant in this case was wired up, Evangelista wasn't. Was that because the government didn't want to admit that they were setting up Landanio and the others, even though Evangelista was a documented jailhouse snitch who reported on people when he was told to? Landanio revealed to Evangelista that Meldish was ordered killed after being disrespectful to the boss, Matthew Madonna. Then, Stevie Wonder and Son passed down the orders to Landanio. So Londanio hired a black guy named Terry to shoot the miscreant. But the idea that the Kriyas had gotten bail while he was still sitting in jail bugged him beyond belief. He told Evangelista that he felt used by the people who gave him the orders to kill Meldish because they knew he was friendly with Meldish, which would afford easy access to him. Plus, Londonio was enraged because he had heard from someone in the MDC that Madonna had reportedly called him a rat. Obviously, the government's ploy had worked. But let's get back to that Stevie Wonder and Son statement for a minute. We already know that nobody calls Kriya Stevie Wonder. 
and certainly not an alleged soldier when referring to one of his alleged bosses, no matter how irate he may have been. So where did Evangelista get the bogus nickname Stevie Wonder? Well, according to pretrial documents, it appears that after Londonio's cell was searched following the bogus escape charge, eight gangland articles were found. If you're a regular gangland reader, you know that they love to refer to Korea by that bogus nickname. At this point in the story, it's unclear if he had previously read the articles in Landanio's cell. But court documents show that Evangelista had read a gangland article provided to him by his lawyer before he talked with prosecutors. He also later admitted in court testimony that he had even talked with prosecutors and agents about a certain gangland article one time. So it's fair to speculate that Evangelista might have read about Stevie Wonder from those articles. Perhaps he thought he would sound more credible using the nickname. Or it could be that Otto just helped him along. Another Ted Otto special, as Carnese once said to Gangland when referring to the escape charge. After all, the government needed something to tie Korea to the murder since Pasqua was a sinking ship. If that seems questionable, then what about the hundreds of thousands of documents and tens of thousands of audio recordings the government possessed from over 20 years worth of investigations tied to the current case and even before? Somewhere in all that material, someone would have said the word Stevie Wonder, right? Nope. In all those recordings and documents, there was not one reference to anyone ever calling Kriya Stevie Wonder, Wonder Boy, or Herbie. The myth of Stevie Wonder was on its deathbed. But like everything in the government's magical world, Stevie Wonder got an unexpected life jolt in the first week of the trial. And like Pasqua before him, Evangelista's testimony was about to transform into a magnificent work of art come October 2019. First of all, salute to MS and the button guys at the New York Mafia.com. Another great article. Part two Guilt for the Guiltless The Story of Stephen Crea, The Murder of Michael Meldish, and Other Tales. Part two The Rat Squaw Files. Gentlemen, you know the routine. First of all, let us thank the person that sponsored the show, Justice Tech Pros. Salute to Dominic and the whole team. Please check them out and subscribe to them today. You will not regret it. Mob Story Season 2, Big Rich. Salute to Team Ruckus. Like, comment, share. And gentlemen, let me know what you're throwing in the air this evening. Friday night. Let's get it right. Salute.